Yes, thank you uh, so much for joining us uh, this afternoon, especially on uh, such short notice. Uh, we wanted to provide you a couple of updates. Um, first, we do have our first case of confirmed uh, COVID-19 uh, here in the islands. It was a resident who w traveled on the Grand Princess, uh, disembarked the vessel in Mexico, and returned home to the islands. Uh, they got sick. They uh, contacted their healthcare provider, uh, and we tested them, and they are positive uh, for COVID-19. We do. We. This is not a case of spread in the community. We wanted to uh, re-emphasize that. We believe that they became uh, infected uh, on the trip itself. Uh, we also wanted to provide an update um, on the Grand Princess, which is anchored off the coast of California. Uh, first state and federal partners are working together to manage the situation in a systemic and comprehensive manner. Our first and foremost concern is the safety of our community. Um, as you know, we have been preparing uh, for an eventual case. We are now able to test here in the islands, which increases our ability to monitor and track um, the virus. We have been working hard to ensure that all appropriate steps are being taken uh, to protect the public and prepare for COVID-19. Uh, we learned from Vice President Mike Pence's news conference this afternoon that 21 individuals, 19 crew members, and two passengers on the cruise ship, the Grand Princess, have tested positive for COVID-19. The ship is currently anchored offshore of San Francisco while they await um, further test results. Uh, we know that this vessel was in Hawaii and made stops on Kauai on February 26th, in Honolulu on February 27th, in Lahaina, Maui on February 28th, and in Hilo, Hawaii, February 29th. Um, so we are working with the CDC and federal partners to um, get the manifest and, and passengers that may have um, departed the vessel, and we'll be working to um, um, identify potential contacts and track um, anyone who may have had contact or been exposed to uh, the COVID virus. Uh, with that, I would uh, like to turn this over to um, Director Anderson. Uh, first, let me say that um, we do have the manifest of the passengers that disembarked in Hawaii. Uh, as the governor mentioned, uh, the cruise ship made ports of call in uh, Willy Willy Harbor on February 26th, Honolulu Harbor on February 27th, Lahaina on February 28th, and in Hilo on February 29th. We're going to be contacting everyone who disembarked from the vessel, asking them to self-quarantine, and uh, we'll be following up to get a detailed history of their activities while they were here. We'll be identifying close contacts and, of course, following up with all of those individuals. Uh, and then we will, of course, follow up from that point. Um, we have a lot to know. We still a lot to learn about what happened um, and the circumstances here. We're, we're, we wanted to let you all know as soon as we got word um, that, that this uh, ship did have uh, individuals on it that were uh, exposed to and uh, were infected with uh, COVID-19. Um, we understand there were some uh, Passengers on the ship, there were Hawaii residents. Uh, we're not sure exactly how many, but there may have been as many as uh, four passengers who were from Hawaii uh, on that vessel. And um, again, we'll get a much more un detailed understanding of exactly who was on the vessel and who may have disembarked from the vessel um, over the next day or two. So uh, we're actively lo looking at those uh, individuals who are here, uh, contacting them, asking them about contacts, and and we will have a lot more to, uh, to offer uh, in the near future on, on exactly what the circumstances were. Um, glad to answer any questions you might have. Um, so the person who is our first confirmed case, can you give us a few more details? Did, did he seek the health care provider here in Honolulu on, on another island? Just so people who maybe have been in contact can get a little bit of understanding. 
understanding and prepare? As far as we know, he was on Oahu throughout the, uh, the time, since the time he um, returned. Uh, he did seek medical care and was tested and found to be positive for uh, COVID-19 today. The medical care, was it in a hospital? Was it in a doctor setting? What can you tell us just so that other people can be a little aware? Yeah. I, uh, Sarah, do you want to um, share with them what you can share about the case? Sure. So this individual fell ill while here in the islands, contacted their doctor, um, got tested, and um, assessed appropriately, and was able to go home because they weren't that ill, um, and is doing fine at home. So really, um, by as we prepared to test, we investigate these things. This is part of our routine, and we know that the person did not have close contact with anyone here since falling ill. So that's good news for us. We um, don't believe that there's community spread of the virus uh, at this time. You know, as we had uh, mentioned earlier, we now do have the capability of uh, testing, and we are developing um, a process so that we can begin to do uh, sentinel testing in our community so that we can get a sense of whether uh, the virus is here. Uh, so certainly we'll be uh, developing those plans and rolling it out at a later time. So, so when do you think you can do broader community testing? I mean, it's the reason Seattle is in this predicament is because it didn't do widespread testing quick enough? Cer certainly, I do think that part of that is driven by um, the ability to test and, and the number of cases that we may or may not see. So we are monitoring that. We are looking at um, potential um, spread. We have informed all of our healthcare care um, professionals about what symptoms to look for and what would be the, the um, case work that they would be looking at that would um, lead us to test for the COVID-19 virus. So we, we do believe that uh, our, our physicians across the state are well positioned to identify potential cases and identify those for testing. You know, we would be work looking at a broader um, sentinel testing plan and um, right, Bruce, you might. Yeah. Let me elaborate a little more. We were, um, we are planning a sentinel uh, uh, survey of, of, of um, individuals here who have respiratory illness to see if some of that might, it might be unrecognized, COVID-19. Uh, we were planning that to begin possibly as early as next week. Uh, frankly, with the situation here and, and the uncertain testing requirements, we may have to put that off a bit, but our plan was to go forward with that, that program. Um, we were looking to potentially sample as many as 200 uh, individuals and, uh, and run those samples here in Hawaii. Um, so we would hopefully have some results within a, a couple of weeks. Obviously, this is an issue all over the country where uh, we're looking to see uh, whether there is virus circulating within the community. Let me emphasize that we have no evidence that there is virus circulating in the community. This first case that we have now was clearly exposed on that first voyage and, uh, and became ill because of that exposure. And that was consistent with all the previous cases we've had here. So we have no evidence that anyone has been exposed and is ill f in, from having come into contact with someone here in Hawaii. We've um, now done a total of eight uh, PUIs since we could do the analysis on Friday. We, we can ramp up that, uh, of course, and our um, capacity is at least 250 per, per week, and if we need to, we can double that, um, which should give us an opportunity to look at individuals who have serious illness. To do the surveys we discussed will require, of course, a lot more sampling and testing. So we're, we're um, working that into to what we're doing um, in case investigations. Obviously, the case investigations are going to come first. They're a higher priority for us because we want to be sure that anyone who's ill will be tested quickly, and that way we can follow up on contacts and so forth. So why haven't we maximized testing capacity already? 
we've had the test since last week. <laughs> we are ramping up as quickly as we can, and I expect within a week or two we will be close to capacity. I think. Is this, um, this one of the eight that you've tested, and then when I you test positive, do you have to send it to the CDC to get a confirmation test? Yes, any positive that we get in our lab um, is sent to the CDC for confirmation. But I just wanted to say, you know, um, the reason that we're not going out and randomly testing, like take 10 of us here and, and run the test, we do want to be smart about identifying who might actually have the virus. You know, we uh, have limited capacity. We want to focus on those who are most sick. We want to be able to uh, have the tests available uh, for those who might need it the most. And so we are counting on our physicians and healthcare network to identify those who are the highest probability candidates who might have the virus, and those are the ones that we're testing. So what's that threshold then? Is it uh, uh, this illness plus age plus travel? What's the threshold to determine that if they need a test? Uh, priority for us is test individuals with a severe illness who have a travel history to an area where we know the virus is circulating. That's expanded dramatically uh, now that we have a number of countries that are um, uh, struggling with this issue. Not, it's not just China. We've got South Korea, Iran, and recently a lot of cases coming in from Italy. Uh, any exposure to those areas with, with symptoms where other diseases can be ruled out, such as the flu and other common viruses, uh, are our first priority. Those are the ones we focus on. Some of the doctors are saying that, sorry, yeah, doctors in the community, community, some of them are frustrated because they said that they've been asking for tests and it's been denied. What would you say to that? I mean, these are We've, we've been we've used this um, uh, priority for testing uh, consistently since uh, we started. First of all, let me say that when CDC was doing the testing for us, they had an even stricter requirement for this. So we've actually broadened our our case definitions to include uh, many of these other countries and circumstances. So as we go th forward, we want to be sure we can focus on the high priorities. I might mention, um, uh, you, you may have heard that uh, many of the private labs are considering testing. There are at least two or three major national laboratories now that are developing the capability to do testing, and it's very likely they will be offering this test within a week or two to physicians who uh, need samples tested. Um, even the local labs are considering um, starting up that testing process. and. Uh, that will dramatically expand on the number of people who can be tested. All individuals who are tested are going to need to go through their physician. The physician needs to order the test, whether it's a private lab or the state lab. So if you're, if you're sick and you've had exposure system of concern, you need to talk to your physician and they can make arrangements for testing. We do require that the um, it, that the individual be tested for flu and that be ruled out before we would test for coronavirus. Most laboratories, most hospitals and other medical facilities can test for the flu and lots of other uh, potential respiratory problems. That should not be a barrier for anyone uh, who's in a major medical clinic or, or hospital. So are the travel requirements still in place? Oh yeah. Well, the, the travel requirements are in place. Good question. <laughs> travel requirements are in place for uh, testing. Now that we know that virus is circulating in other communities, if the person has severe symptoms compatible with with uh, COVID-19 and has no travel history, um, we are testing that individual if other causes of the illness are ruled out. So. It's not necessary that you have a travel history that is uh, a risk. Um, we are testing individuals who, who may not have that travel history, 
who have symptoms that could be compatible with uh, uh, COVID-19. Are you testing anybody who had contact with this person who now is confirmed to have it just out of a precaution? Yeah. I'm going to ask uh, Sarah jump in on that one. <laughs> As I said, based on the information we have so far, we are not aware that this person had close contact with anyone since becoming ill. Precautions were taken at the, um, by the healthcare provider when the person was tested. So we don't believe there are close contacts. We are, of course, verifying that. It's always important to verify, and if there were any contacts identified um, who were ill, they would get tested. So again, the person was on the voyage, um, the first voyage for this cruise ship, from which there were ill passengers that had um, departed the ship and then were found to test positive. And so um, the person then, uh, I, I believe, disembarked in Mexico, traveled back to the islands, and then fell ill here. And so was not ill while traveling. And that's. Um, so right now, as I said, we've asked about any potential contacts, and that includes household contacts. Right now, we are not aware of any. We are continuing to investigate. And where is the patient now, and what will the quarantine isolation process be? They remain at home. They're doing well, so that's a good place for them to be. If anything should change and they need medical care, our facilities are prepared to, to care for them appropriately. Do they have We have protocols in place in the event that we ever identify a confirmed case who has household contacts, family members they're living with. And so we always will be implementing those protocols. And that does include um, either separating from household members um, where that's possible or um, following instructions. The CDC has provided guidance for how to take care of someone at home who may have coronavirus. Is this a mandatory quarantine then? And what does that really mean? Is he barred from leaving the home and is, you know, to ensure that he doesn't just go out or, or something along those lines? We have almost 90 people now who are in, in uh, home quarantine. Basically, uh, this is a, a situation where their, their movements and uh, ac activities are, are, ex are limited extensively. Uh, they're required to take uh, their temperatures twice a day and we check in on them regularly to make sure that they're home and that they're well. Of course, if they are sick, they're to notify us immediately. Um, we've had excellent compliance with virtually everyone who has been in this situation. Most people don't want to get other people sick and of course they want to take care of themselves. So uh, this has worked out very well. This home quarantine is used across the country. Every state is using it. Um, and uh, it's, it's working very well for us as it is now. People are comfortable in their homes. They're likely to be far more compliant in their homes than they are in some strange place where uh, it's, not, it's less comfortable. We could, but uh, again, um, uh, capacity is limited in terms of how many samples we can take. You know, one of the problems we have going into this whole situation is we don't really know how many people we're talking about. Um, we need to be sure that we're pacing ourselves and able to handle what we anticipate we'll need to be able to handle. Uh, given what the situation today, I think we can handle the testing that we need to at the health department, and if the private labs can come in and fill some of the gaps. Uh, I think we're in pretty good shape here as it relates to uh, laboratory testing. Director, when did this person disembark the cruise ship on Oahu? They disembarked. Remember, remember, yeah. Um, so they flew back home. Right. So just to just to reiterate, this individual was on a uh, a cruise that went to um, yeah. Mexico. The cruise lasted from the 11th to the 21st of last month. At some point uh, before the ship actually came from Mexico back to San Francisco, this individual flew from Mexico 
straight back to Honolulu and, uh, and, as, and became ill when they were here, sought medical care. The physicians uh, uh, identified this as a possible case. And of course, we just uh, got the results today on the, uh, on the uh, testing, which was positive. I don't have that handy. Uh, Sarah, do you know that? Exactly. Yeah. If you want, we can try to get back to you with those dates. Um, again, the individual, I think, was aware of the situation. They did uh, take uh, precautions, stayed home, became ill, and, uh, and sought medical care uh, appropriately when that happened. Another thing I want to reinforce that the governor said is that our healthcare community here has been, I think, well informed on the problem, our physicians are aware of what to look for and uh, I think have done an exceptional job in, in trying to identify potential cases such as this and, uh, and referred to them to us for testing when it's appropriate. So he was among the self-quarantined under monitoring by DOH who was perhaps told by DOH to stay home as soon as he returned? Was he included in that 90 um, individual figure that you were mentioning earlier? Sarah, can you, can you speak to some of that? I, I don't. Um, those exact circumstances. So the the notification of the positive test from the cruise ship came after many people had already disembarked or had other travel plans. So this was the case in, for this individual as well. They, there was no notification yet of a positive test from that cruise ship at the time they traveled home. So this came to light after the person had become sick However, as we've been telling all of our providers, any person coming in with respiratory illness or influenza should really be uh, treated in a similar way where you're very careful with acute respiratory illness. You make sure that you're assessing your patients in a way that um, won't expose any healthcare providers and put them at risk. So um, I'm glad to say some of the preparations that our healthcare facilities have been making are paying off and that people are thinking about this. And it's flu season, so I think we're used to thinking about this as healthcare providers. I'm not sharing additional details at this time, just for um, as we continue to investigate and for confidentiality reasons. Can you tell us what airline you flew on? I don't have that information. Again, the the travel on the airline would have been while this individual was asymptomatic, so that would be a no risk situation. We have heard that asymptomatic is not necessarily no risk. Are we? Has that changed in the recent days? That it's definitely no risk when there's no symptoms. So what, when we work with um, CDC on travel-associated concerns, uh, their way of stratifying risk really looks at um, people who are symptomatic while traveling. I am, we're all, we've heard about these reports of potential asymptomatic um, detection of the virus. It's not clear at this time what that means as far as transmission. But so far, based on all the data that's available to us and to CDC, it's, it's not looking like people who are asymptomatic are transmitting the virus. So our focus remains on uh, symptomatic individuals. Governor, are, we, are you considering banning cruise ships at all? Uh, we don't have the authority to ban cruise ships. The, the Coast Guard is pretty strict about uh, what they're looking at. As you know, they did ban any cruise ships that sailed in China, and I'm certain that the CDC and uh, Coast Guard are talking all the time about uh, increased restrictions on both uh, cruise ships as well as uh, air travel. At what point are you going to pull the trigger on social distancing, especially for elderly people, since this virus really impacts that? Well, I do think everyone should take responsibility for their own health, and every Everyone needs to assess their situation. Anyone uh, who has a kupuna who they believe um, uh, are at risk, so has respiratory um, challenges, um, certainly we would encourage them to be smart about it and um, avoid large events with large crowds. 
and those kinds of activities. You know, by the same token, we would encourage everyone who um, gets a cold, respiratory, coughing, sneezing, and a fever to talk to your doctor. And if you travel to any of these countries or now states that have community spread, you should share that information with your physician so they can make an appropriate assessment about whether you would be a candidate for COVID-19 testing. You know, I know that we could test everybody in this room, um, and it's really not a smart use of resources. You know, we do rely on our physicians to make informed decisions about uh, whether a patient would be at risk of uh, COVID-19 uh, and then request the test and the test would be executed. Well, some physicians are saying they have requested tests and it wasn't granted. Well, certainly we'd be happy to, to follow up with those uh, individuals. You know, the physicians do uh, control the process. So there is um, a criteria that they go through but it's certainly been uh, relaxed in um, the last few days, in fact. I have time for just one more question that I want to wrap up. Sarah, I know you said you don't have the, the timeline just yet. What, can, when was this person tested? When does the test come back? How long are we talking about a turnaround since that person is asymptomatic when the test is done? And, and when did you get the results today? Right, the test was collected yesterday and run today. So we were able to get uh, same day results for this particular. So hours to turn it around. Yes, as long as um, testing volume remains relatively low, that turnaround is very quick. It is possible as testing volume goes up, it may be a little bit longer. We're um, working very hard to maintain a 24-hour turnaround on testing. And then it still has to go to the CDC, or you've already sent it? To the a CDC? positive test gets confirmed at CDC. And how long will that take before you get that back? That may take longer. So, so you don't it have can take, it, it, it factors in shipping time. And um, again, running the test doesn't take, isn't the longest part of the process. It's really the shipping from the islands. And that's why we're very glad to have the test here. It's a presumptive positive, but it's something we can act on now. I was going to say, I think it's most important that once we get a positive test um, from our state lab, we assume that that person has COVID-19 and every action that we take is assuming that that person uh, does have the virus. Um, so the CDC uh, test is really just a confirmation. Every action that we take once we uh, con uh, con once we get a positive reading on COVID-19 is assuming that the individual has has the virus. Can I just do one more? Who at GOH did, um, authorizes the test? Is there a single person or who, who authorizes who gets tested? We have, a, we have a team in our Division of Outbreak Disease Control that um, that makes those decisions and, and we get um, numerous requests every day for that. How many requests and how many have been denied? I couldn't give you that number offhand. Um, if the, if the request meets the case definition, uh, we consistently uh, will we'll have that test done. Most physicians are able to screen out uh, individuals who have some other illness. Keep in mind, there's a lot of flu going around, and most of the cases they see are the flu. So that's one of the obvious things they would look for. You know, I think we've, we've our commitment, the health department is the lead agency in this, this outbreak disease um, prevention and control effort. Uh, we're going to be letting you know what we know, and we're going to let you tell you what we don't know <laughs> in these situations. Um, we do want to bring you up to date on, on the situation, um, and, uh, and when we have more information on this, we will share that with you, so um, you can answer questions there. I expect in the next day or two, we're going to have a lot more information than we have now. We've known about this cruise ship now for uh, about an hour and a half, and, and, and here we are. Um, without all the answers to your questions, but I hope you appreciate that we're, we want to keep you up to date on, on what we do know, and we will continue to do that. Um, um, as we get private laboratory testing in place, some of these issues associated with being not being able to, uh, to do the tests that some physicians might like will, will be hopefully resolved. One thing I can guarantee is things will change very rapidly <laughs> as we go forward, but you have our commitment that we're going to be uh, keeping you up to date and uh, and hopefully trying to answer your your questions as we go forward. Dr. Okay, Anderson, could this have been a, because the CDC didn't confirm this, could this have been a false positive that tested here? 
white wait for the CDC to confirm? I'm, I'm sorry, you asked about a false positive? Because you're waiting for CDC to give a confirmation, could this have been a, the test done here been a false positive white it's, wait for CDC? It's possible, but again, as the governor pointed out, we resolve any uncertainties in favor of protecting public health. Any, any test that's positive is assumed to be a presumptive positive, and we'll act accordingly. We'll assume that is positive unless it's found to be negative. So that uh, this is how we would operate now and going forward. We'll make it free. So thank you again, and uh, try open for additional information. <laughs>